Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is from Hollywood to Houseplant with Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. Thank you. I was going to say, hello. Like, uh, come on. <laughs> that didn't count. I made you I was, do it. Come I was, on. I was, I was joking. I guilted you into clapping for us. <laughs> I was joking while we were back there. I'm like, it's not every day that People Magazine is pulling credentials to come see me. Uh, so it's great to have two of the most amazing innovators in Hollywood today and, and in business and others. Uh, as most know, Seth, of course, is a major movie star in addition to being a producer. Not a movie star, Seth. A major, major, major movie you star. You got the note where I, I, mean, I, come on. I made sure you said We're going to kiss that ass properly <laughs> exactly. for coming. We appreciate my that. My lawyer stipulated major. That's in the contract. Yeah. <laughs> no brown M&Ms, <laughs> exactly. and you have to say major. major. Big time. <laughs> and then Evan, of course, is his best friend, partner, writer. His minor partner. Just say it. Yeah, minor. <laughs> he has to be minor compared to me. That is contractual as well. <laughs> so listen, the, a lot of people have asked me, you know, you've put together this conference. It's grown dramatically over the years. Why actors? Why professors? Why? Because to me, this is about creative thought. It's about innovation. It's about leadership. And when I look at your guy's career, you have innovated across multiple ecosystems. When you think about, you're looking at me so seriously. <laughs> I was really like, wow. I was like, I was like, I wow. Know, so what you're this saying? must be a really good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you think about innovation, where does that start? Um, I think for us, innovation starts with um, loving some. I mean, it's funny because, like, you know, houseplant. We make, it's essentially like a weed lifestyle brand, for those of you who don't know, and maybe the only weed lifestyle brand on the planet, really. Um, and uh, we make, you know, a lifestyle and home goods inspired uh, by our love of weed, you know, and um, uh, which is strong and prevalent and something that we're very proud of, quite honestly. Um, and so uh, when we grew up, we grew up loving movies and you know, we would watch movies obsessively, and we thought we could contribute to the landscape of movies. And we had ideas that we were like, no one has ever quite done this. No one's ever approached movies like this. And that um, was born out of just us wanting to see these movies that didn't exist, but what, in retrospect, you look at, and it's innovation. But it really was born out of, like, a personal desire to have a thing that didn't exist, really. And it was born out of, like, a personal desire to watch movies that hadn't been made yet and a personal desire to smoke weed with beautiful things that hadn't been <laughs> invented yet and 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 it really was born out of like what do we want to experience in our lives that are not currently out there being provided for us you know um and it really is the same thought process that kind of leads us through uh, pretty much everything we do yeah. it's your job now to say ibid yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> just nod. No, no yeah, it's a, and it, it starts always with like super personal stuff for us. It's always yeah. our personal passions. And then we get deep into like, who are we bringing this to and what do they want? So it always starts with like our own personal uh, passion for stuff. And then we always quickly go to like, but who is this for? How are we bringing it to them? Why do they want it? So we, we start selfish and then we think about others. Yes, exactly. Because we will want to sell this thing to those people at some point. First we want it in our house. Exactly. Then and then we're like, would other people pay for this too? <laughs> so it, it is interesting, right? So a lot of people associate you guys with super bad, right? Like I, I, I had my McLovin fake ID, like a lot of people, <laughs> right? And we used, I mean, I can't think of terms that we use to make fun of our friends that didn't come out of movies that you guys wrote at some point. Yeah. Uh, but we, you got... we invented the phrase DTF, so. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And we're so proud of it. We're that. very proud of it, yeah. <laughs> By the way, one of my favorite phrases. Well, you, you, we... you, you've used it 20 times a day. <laughs> at least. <So. laughs> well, Evan, you are I looking. I kept turning to Evan and be like, why is he keep saying that? Yeah. <laughs> has, has like, I think to do David's with DTF. I this think is... he seems DTF. Well, <laughs> Seth, you are looking cute today. No, so, you. Know, it's, uh, <laughs> but in all seriousness, you guys started much younger than that, right? So you started your careers much younger. You were in that Arctic tundra to the north we call Canada, right? Which I believe is 
you know, still above us. Yes. And uh, no, I'm joking to all our Canadian yeah. clients. We love you. Uh, <laughs> but but tell me about how you guys first started. Um, it honestly, uh, our high school uh, had oh, a lot we, of stuff. We met in bar mitzvah class. Oh, yes, of course. Let's start with thing. something Let's very serious. Yes. That's not a joke. No, like, we really literally met, met in bar mitzvah. The tallest, it, was, it was the class you took to prepare for your bar mitzvah. Do you and, know, by the way, when I came out this morning, yeah. I came out to the song, Eye of the Tiger, and I literally said, I feel like this is my bar mitzvah. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot like my bar mitzvah. Um, but uh, <laughs> This is my bar mitzvah suit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I never got a new one. It still fit. He was big. And it, by the way, I'm impressed it still fits. It does, it, yeah. it, it, I bought well. <laughs> but yeah, we had we had bar mitzvah class where they gave us free bagels and chocolate milk, which was the draw. Yep, of course. But we went to different schools. That's how Jews do it. Exactly. Yeah. Free food. <laughs> free food worked. That's what brought us together. And then we went to high school together, and our high school and our city was like a filming town. We'd see stuff filming all around us. And that was for tax purposes, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, it Very was. Much. They shot the X-Files in Vancouver at the time, and uh, yeah. And we would just, yeah, we'd see it around, and we I mean, started grew to get up, interested. Yeah, and our high school was across the street from two video rental stores. So we like lived at these video rental stores. You could rent seven movies for seven days for $7. And so wow. instead of having social lives, me and Evan would went to seven movies and watch them all over the course of a weekend. A lot of um, it has to do with the fact that girls weren't interested in it. Yes, I really wish it are, wasn't yes. the case, but it is. Yes, they We were, have wives now, so no, jokes on them. They were not DTF. And, By the way, you both yeah. have two beautiful yeah. wives yeah. now, yeah. so <laughs> you're, you're living the dream nowadays. Yeah. But uh, and also, and it links to this, we're from Vancouver, which at the time was probably one of the most like weed-friendly cities in all of North America. Interesting. Yeah, and, and probably something we didn't really understand. Like we yeah. assumed everyone's parents also smoked weed, and yeah. wasn't. And the cops just were like, "Don't do that." Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I thought you could smoke weed everywhere, and then as soon as I moved to LA, I got arrested. <laughs> so, oh, you can't. By the way, I, did you really get yes, arrested? Yes, I really did. Oh, I know. I was, I was, so you can't smoke weed everywhere is what I learned. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, we. Uh, so we were from yeah. Kind of this like uh, this like cultural epicenter of of weed, you know, and we grew up loving weed and smoking weed. I started smoking weed when I was in high school, and uh, which you know is not a part of our, like our official company, uh, you know, slogan here or anything, but <laughs> it's it's how I personally started doing it. Um, and then, yeah, we started writing a movie based on just the shit that would happen to us in high school, basically, because we would watch other movies about high school and be like, none of these represent our experience and what feels true to us and what feels accurate to like what we are going through. It, it, was, it was always kind of like, it's like Revenge of the Nerds or like the jocks and it's right. never about the actual- Well, Revenge of the Nerds had both. Yes, exactly. Touché. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> right. Ser serious question yeah. though. So that's interesting. Yeah. You started writing, I'll assume, that uh, super bad, yeah. right? So that's first movie, yeah. high school, epic movie. You are in Vancouver when you start writing it? Uh -huh. Or you've moved to LA, gotten arrested, no, we were, and are writing it in prison? No, we started right exactly. <laughs> it's like those uh, rapper songs that right. were released through the prison telephone. Um, no, we were no. literally in, in grade eight, which is the first year of high school where we're from, and we started writing it. We do it differently when here. When we exactly, were 12 yeah. or 13. <laughs> yeah. And we worked on it for a decade. Yeah, and in that time, I was doing stand-up comedy uh, around Vancouver, which I started doing when I was around 13, and I got an agent through doing stand-up comedy, wow. and then I got cast on a TV show called Freaks and Geeks. Um, I remember I, that yeah, show. When I was... You 16. were on that? Yeah, exactly. When I was 16. <laughs> You're that old? Yeah, I am that old. I was I'm 16. Joking. Yeah, we made the show in 1998, and I got cast from Vancouver. Like, it was an open casting call in Vancouver, so I moved to Los Angeles with a job, basically. At 13? Uh, at 16. At 16? Uh, yeah. So, I just so you got arrested at 16 Yes, I got arrested pot. when I was around 17 after got I moved it. to LA. Took you a year. It took me a year to <laughs> go to Malibu. And uh, yeah, exactly. literally, we were like, we always smoke weed in our apartments. Let's get out and smoke weed. And then we instantaneously <laughs> got arrested. Um, but, and around then is when me and Evan, no one was making super bad. Uh, and we were a little older and our sensibility shifted. And we started writing a movie called Pineapple Express, which, Honestly, in a lot of ways, is kind of what led to the launch of House Plant um, as well, because um, we we really just loved weed and we would smoke weed. Um, yeah, and, and we, by we the way, there of, seems to be yes, a theme exactly. here. Yeah, right? It is a real uh, theme, man. Just in uh, case yeah. anyone was wondering, but yeah. uh, a Pineapple Express was—it's the same as all these things to us. We were like, what if there was a good movie about weed instead of all these silly movies? They're always like kind of looking down on it. was Cheech and Chong, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, or they're like not real movies, right. like Cheech and yeah. Chong, which is like funny and kind of like a series of sketches thrown together, but like by 
real movie standards does not hold oh, up no, in yeah. maybe any capacity, you know? Um, and so, yeah, that was the thought, was like, we love weed, we love movies, what if someone, what if, I, we wish there was like a real movie for people like us, you know? Um, yeah, and, and it did very well, and then over the years, the number one thing people would come up to us and talk about is Pineapple Express, again and again and again. Well, it's a you, great, it's a great movie. Well, we just realized they like saw themselves. They were like, oh, like someone actually made like a high caliber like yeah. studio film. And what we actually saw was that this whole subtext of Pineapple Express was this movie was made by incredibly stoned people. And, um, and the movie got very good reviews. It made over $100 million in theaters. It cost $20 million to make. It became a, like, one, like a cultural sensation. The music from it was really popular. It got nominated for a Golden Globe. And what was very validating to people who smoked weed was this sense of like stoned people did this. Right. And they were entrusted and they with, finished and it, they did it, and they, they were released entrusted it. with tens of millions of dollars. They didn't let anyone down. It was delivered on time. And not only that, it turned out really great and everyone loved it. And people who don't smoke weed even liked it. And, and it, it kind of like asserted itself as like culturally relevant, whether people who didn't smoke weed liked it or not. And that was something that for people who smoked weed was like so validating. And we could see they would come up to us and it was like we were, we were like really speaking to them. And it was like, again, like the, the feeling was like, I've always been told I'm a loser for smoking weed. I've always been told I'll never amount to anything and never do anything and kind of never get to where I want to get in life. And you guys stoned off your fucking asses when you were 25 years old, made this movie that did great, got great reviews, got awards, and like did everything that a movie is supposed to do. So, so you now you've, you, you, you've got a nine year window there, right? So you're in Hollywood, you're yeah. 16, you've been arrested in Malibu yep. at 17. <laughs> Evan had to finish college to get a so green Evan's card. So Evan's at McGill. His dad's American, so he You're at down. McGill yeah, up there, right? Yeah. The, like we're, and you're, you're trying to figure out where to go. No, you're figuring you're, life out. You're exactly. figuring it out, so you get there. Were you on Freaks and Geeks for like that no, nine Freaks years? No, Freaks and Geeks canceled like, after uh, like 15 episodes, basically. Did, was Pineapple Express the first film you made, or did you make? No. What's really crazy is we had written Superbad and Pineapple Express, and meanwhile, I was uh, we were working with Judd Apatow on uh, a movie called Knocked Up as well. And these were all scripts we had. That was my next question, yeah. by the way. And then in 2005, The 40-Year-Old Virgin came out, which was a movie that I had worked on with Judd, and it was really popular. And Basically, every studio was like, whatever Certainly you... made Kelly Clarkson famous. Exactly, yes. <laughs> I, 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 it really does. People scream her name at her to this day. Um, and uh, so I... Uh, and then they were... It was like the floodgates opened, and in one... 12-month period, we made Knocked Up, Superbad, and Pineapple Express. Unbelievable. Um, and so it was this, like, kind of manic work, like... Oddly, uh, I started going bald during that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know if that's a coincidence. It did grow back, yeah. yeah. I, I thought it would grow back once we finished I was filming. literally going to say, because my next question was, like, <laughs> Knocked Up was a different genre, right? Like, it was, it was you were like more comedy. serious, it's a, a romantic serious. comedy, yeah. you were with... Uh, Captain Igo. Yeah, it, it was all the same, it was, it was but, but it showed just different things that we were all But it was doing. a different yeah. side of you, right? So yeah. I was gonna say, how did you get from one of these genres to the other, but it sounds like they were intermingled. Yes, we did them all at the same time, and, um, and, in one, and we had finished shooting all of them before any of them came out, so, like, we didn't know how any of them would be received or at all, so, like, we just had these movies, and then and then what's crazy is every one of them was like a massive success. And I was like, you know, we're in our mid-20s. I just assumed like, Hollywood's easy. This is like, great. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's everyone By the way, was this, yeah. was this like your goodwill hunting, yeah, right? Yeah, really this like, this just, just like, happened. Oh yeah, you show up in your 20s, you write movies, they all get great reviews, make hundreds of millions of dollars, it's fucking great. By the way, Seth, uh, yeah. it seems, <laughs> Hollywood That's not seems, how it was. Well, Hollywood <laughs> seems to be working out for you this week yeah, too. But, yeah. but when, when you take that, so let's, yeah. Let's move on from that just yeah. for a second. Your creative process is really interesting to me. I, you know, I've spent only a few hours with you guys, but it is so evident how you play off each other, how you interact. How has your partnership changed the way you think of creativity versus the way you think you would have done it separately? It's kind of like... I know that's we, not on the list no, of questions, no, it's, it's actually we, what I find interesting. We never did anything <laughs> apart, more or less. Yeah. And we literally, like, were kids together learning how to work together, and so we, like, forged the same work ethic and have, like, always been, like, very much, like, 
connected. And so like there's, it's, it's synergistic. Yeah, I, I really think our approach to creativity is built around partnership. And I think that's not how everyone gets to approach creativity, you know? But I think literally like our, our creative minds, because we were so young, like formed around this idea of bouncing ideas off of one another and encouraging one another and critiquing one another and, and also yeah. specifically with writing like a lot of the writers are like I ran I've been slamming my head against the wall trying to solve this thing and I was like yeah when that happens I turn to Seth yeah and we talk or we we'll smoke for a walk. yeah we yeah. do we'll, we'll go take a break we'll literally let's, let's we'll smoke a problem. joint we'll go for a walk um, yeah I mean we I mean but we always like we would write it's funny when we would write super bad I remember like I literally lived with my parents and you lived with yours when we were writing it and we would sit in a parked car smoking weed with a computer <laughs> Like, because we had nowhere else we could go. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, so our, our creative process, and we always, we work with other people too. Like, Evan will write with other people from time to time. I'll write with other people from time to time for our same company. But we, we, we are more than happy to, like, split up and, 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 and bring, like, I think this creative partnership, like, work ethic into other dynamics as well. Yeah, I think people yeah. silo themselves off and, and are alone for a lot, and it, it's a bad idea, generally speaking. But I think it also leads to more strife in a partnership, yeah. right? It's good to bring that fresh energy in. We're also very lucky, and we know a lot of writing teams and directing teams and creative teams that have not lasted in the way that we have, you know? and, <laughs> I, and I, Not many last more yeah. than a year. Uh, and it's really, uh, uh, and it's nice, and it's something that, like, is not lost on us that... Um, but I am going to announce today that we're breaking up. No. <laughs> by the way, it seemed like you, the right venue. By the way, <laughs> if you Zeta would do that, that lead. Yeah. Zeta Live will be on, like, on the Tonight Show. This will be like great. No, in, in, in all seriousness. So, one of the things I find so interesting about your guys' side of your guys' evolution has been your willingness to take risk, right? Because a lot of your movies are risky. I mean, you've started. Yeah, we almost started a nuclear war with one of them. Well, we so, could yeah. talk about that. I'm not. I, I wasn't sure. Like your yeah. PR people were like, "Don't mention yeah. uh, this or that or this." But everyone knows it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 known, but we all talk about it behind you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. In, in all seriousness, right? Like you guys, people always ask me, "What are the keys to success?" And the answer is, you can't put them in a bottle, right? Nobody really knows. You guys, if somebody said you had to write a movie, write a book about it, you couldn't figure it out, right? But you just know how to do it. It's the same thing with being an entrepreneur or CEO. Everybody asks, you give great great answers, but the truth of the matter is, a lot of this is just intrinsic inside of you guys. But to be successful, in my opinion, you have to have a very high aptitude for risk. Not just risk, because taking risk, would you bet a dollar to lose a dollar with no upside and pretend it's a million? The answer is probably not. Would you bet a million dollars to potentially win 10 million and the worst you could do is lose 750,000? You'd probably take that bet, right? You've already lost me, but yes. <laughs> that, uh, we're not math guys. Not math. That was far I, too many I, numbers. I literally dropped out of high school in 11th grade. So I don't, please, please keep it pre-junior level. And by the way, <laughs> you were in jail within two years. Exactly. So like, no, all right, let's put it this way. You've got to be able to take smart risk. Yes. How do you guys think of risk in your businesses? Yeah. Not just in create in, in Hollywood, but I mean, in, in the, the truth is we like follow our passion and if it's risky, we still do it. And if it isn't risky, we still do it. Like we kind of don't assess ri risk. Risk, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think it, it's true. Like we if we love something, you will have a hard time convincing us it's a bad idea. And if we know that if it came out a movie, a product, a thing, a record, whatever it is, we know if it came out and this is and, and someone else did it and not us, and we would be so mad and jealous that we weren't the ones who got to do it, and we would be like, fuck, like, why didn't we, like, we had that idea, and these, and someone else beat us to it, or someone else got to do it, like, if we feel like that way about an idea where, like, not only do we love it, but the idea of someone else doing it is, like, terrifying to you, then, Y y you won't convince us it's a bad idea. And like with Superbad, like we finished writing it when we were around 18 and then heard for six years from everyone in Hollywood that like, no, they were just like, no, like it's funny, but no, no one's gonna make like this, like, and it's funny in retrospect, but the idea of a very R-rated high school comedy 
was not yeah. marketable because technically its target audience cannot pay to go see the movie. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and that was it. That's what they'd say in the, movie, the, the meetings. They'd be like, it's hilarious. If you made it PG-13, we'd make it. And we'd like, that ruins the whole fucking thing. The whole point is that. And I think to them, that would be a risk. And to us, it was insane not to do it. You know? yeah, yeah, to me, one of the ones that stands out is Sausage Party. Yes. Is a movie about food I, fucking I each other? I can see why. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, I get that. <laughs> but that was the real thing where people are like, you sure you want to do this for eight years? <laughs> yes, exactly. And make, like, very little money? And we just couldn't stop ourselves. We couldn't stop. And I remember we literally had a meet. Like, every, we, we, thank God. There was a moment where we were going to pitch the movie Ooh. dressed in hot dog costumes. That's, <laughs> like, that's how, like, confident we were it was going to sell. And nobody bought it. We went to every studio in Hollywood. And after every <laughs> meeting, after every call, where they, we would, like, literally, like, be in the parking lot, like, walking back to our car and our agents would call and be like, they don't want it. And I'd be like, thank God we're not dressed as hot dogs right now. <laughs> that, the only thing that would make this worse is if we were like getting into my car, like navigating our But they might have bought it costume. if we'd worn Maybe the Maybe that was the thing. And I remember we were like, we're... Someone was like, do you want to stop? Do you want, like, we were like, we're just going to do that. Wait until there's like a new person running one of these studios. Which is like two that's weeks. That's what right? always yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> Megan cool. Ellison start, created a studio in the Annapurna. And like, it didn't exist when we first tried to sell it. Then she came into existence and then she bought it. And then we so, made it. So, so uh, to yeah. translate this into maybe marketing speak, you yeah. believe the biggest risk is not going with your gut. Oh, yeah. At not least for us, yeah. yeah. For us, it is. For us, and, I, and now we, I think we've gotten more sensitive to it over the years, too, like, because things can easily stray, and gravity pulls things in terrible directions at times, and sometimes you have to, like, aggressively fight that gravity to keep your original vision clear um, and in focus, you know, and and so that's something we talk about and a gravity's lot. Gravity's code word for money. Money, gravity studios, money, <laughs> all that shit, you know what I mean? I've and heard so, of it. Yeah, exactly, and so that's something we talk about a lot is like, you know, and especially with movies and things, like anything creative, it's like well, a death by a thousand cuts, where like little things start to change and then you take a step back and you're like, uh-oh, we're now making a thing no one likes, not me, not the audience, not the people, not anybody. Nobody likes this. And I think that's something that I always recognize. We're like, as long as at least someone is like incredibly passionate about what is happening, it really helps like fight gravity. <laughs> so Mikey, yes. the CEO of Houseplants, is going to kill me yes. if we don't get to Houseplants. Please. Right? So, but <laughs> in all seriousness, right? Yeah. So I look at you guys, and you know the question here, which is how did you think of it? Like we've gotten that answer seventy two yeah, times. Yeah. You smoke pot, and you want stuff to smoke pot at. That, yeah, at that, that's beautiful. <laughs> but most of the people in your position who are, you know call it highly functioning alcoholics like many of us, <laughs> uh, joke. <laughs> you know, most of the people in your position have created a tequila or a gin or a vodka or a something, right? Yeah. Instead of actually creating a cannabis product that you would consume, yeah. AKA weed. smoke, yeah. weed, you created the accoutrements around it. Yeah. Why? Um, well, we, we, we have had different uh, involvements with selling weed in different capacities. Uh, we sold weed in Canada when it was first federally legal, and Houseplant did sell uh, weed. Um, the problem is... Obviously, I got the wrong No, but, but it's okay, because we don't really anymore, and we do focus on this, because the weed industry itself is, is terrible and very volatile and very can't difficult to navigate. <laughs> and can't truth, take credit cards. And, and, and until it's federally... And, and, and the weed industry is fighting a lot of stigmas and a lot of antiquated thinking, and until it's federally legal, it, it, it's going to be very hard for anyone, I think, to thrive in the actual industry of selling weeds, uh, you know? But that being said, like... We love weed, and 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 yeah, we, and we get that. And, and people, <laughs> I, I will keep saying it because, but honestly, it's something not a lot of people are are comfortable saying, and it's something that I have honestly made a point to say over the years because I know if when I was young and smoking weed and was very self conscious about it, and I saw like a successful functional person out there talking about how much they loved weed, it would have made me feel so much better about myself. So that's you messaging I mean? to you. You're talking to other people 
who might feel badly about themselves that they love weed, yeah. and you're trying to normalize And it. I'm also trying to like look at all the people in those people's lives and in society in general and say, like, just because people like weed, it doesn't mean that they deserve anything less than any other product. I actually think it to speak to why I, we don't have a vodka or alcohol company. Like, I think weed is a way better product than alcohol. Like, weed is one of the best products. Like, people bought weed when you could go to jail for it. Like, how, how well, good by is the way, like, in how, all like, fairness, no one would buy records if you could go to jail for it, yeah. you know? In all like, fairness, <laughs> during Prohibition, they did that with alcohol yeah exactly but but at the same but 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 alcohol but now there's a reason that no one no, sells exactly. alcohol legally because no one's incentivized to and weed needs to be like that that's a whole other topic of conversation Every, okay. <laughs> oh, i think they like the physical manifestation of it all yeah. is like in our homes when we were kids you would put your weed in a box and shove it under your bed and yet everyone has like a martini shaker and an alcohol setup. Right. And so that's oh, kind of like the easiest way to view i've certainly plants. got a martini exactly shaker. and that was exactly but if i come to visit to your house Will you please have a weed set up for you? Exactly. Me? You know what? If you guys come over, Kristen, we need a weed set up. Let's make that happen. My wife is on top but of it. But it was a part of that. Like, people have pride in their alcohol consumption. No, and I agree. It speaks to who they are, and therefore they like to have accoutrements that go along with it that speak to their taste and their style and their sense. And it's like when someone comes yeah. to their house and they have the martini shaker as an example, like, maybe you don't drink martinis, but you have that for your friend. No, my wine cellar, yeah. by the way, I do have to admit something. Yes. You're I an alcoholic. love white, red wine. <laughs> no, I wasn't yeah. going to say that. Yeah. It's true, but no, I love red wine. Right? Red wine's great. And you walk into my house, in my living room, there is a glass yeah. encasing that is my wine cellar that you sort of go Exactly, down to. and I think like... I'm pretty proud of it. Exactly. Yeah. We, we're trying to bring that level of pride of consumption to weed. That's and cool. And an unabashed pride to it, uh, you know, because again, I think... Well, like, what yeah. here gives you pride for I weed? I mean, because I spent my whole life ashing in like a fucking Coke can. <laughs> 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 because That's there was, awesome. Because there was nothing else available. And then... Well, this one's nice, too. Exactly. Well, then I actually started collecting uh, vintage and antique ashtrays because that was the last time people... Which were originally probably for yeah, pipes it and was cigars, for pipes right? And cigars, but it was when smoking was in vogue and people were unabashedly... Yeah, I smoked cigars. I was in that craze lifestyle. years ago. I smoked a lot of cigars. Exactly. And so to me, to have products that are, like, unabashedly lauding... What do you do with that one? This is, a, this is like, uh, an ashtray tray that I actually, I do oh, ceramics and I design this and what's perfect about it oh, is it like go out. there's, no, it's like there's a perfect little rest to rest your joint on it because most people smoke joints, they take a hit or two and then they want to rest it down and then when it's out you put it in the well and it has like a deep well so I you don't have to clean it all the time. I thought most people use a pen. Where do you come down on pens? Are we they, don't fuck with that shit. So right pens now. are bad. <laughs> we don't like it. <laughs> Alright, so now in the two minutes and nine seconds we have left <clears throat> let's talk a bit about your guys philanthropic focus because sure. i mean seth you've been very open i watched your comedy special the other night which was on netflix which yeah. was awesome by the way Thanks. and obviously you and lauren have been touched by alzheimer's yes i will say my grandmother and my uncle both passed away from it tried i mean you know in 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 sort of the bad way that that often happens yeah. i don't have the type of platform that you have you and Lauren have really been out front. I know, Evan, you're involved in all this and everything. I, I just would love to hear more about it. Yeah, um, my wife's mother was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in her 50s um, and was uh, fully incapacitated by it by the time she was in her mid to late 50s and has passed away now. Um, but it was like an over decade long horrible decline. and. You know, my wife started talking about it publicly and openly, and we found that there was like a whole generation of younger people whose parents were uh, experiencing Alzheimer's, and we were also finding that Alzheimer's affects people much younger than we ever thought, and we also then just started to realize how stigmatized Alzheimer's was and how kind of nobody talked about it at yeah. all, really. My grandparents um, would say, you know, my grandfather was was not touched by it. My grandmother was. People would stop socializing. Oh, yeah. they Because the older people that were their friends for 40 or 50 years didn't want to see that reflection. Yeah, it was just too sad. And so uh, we started an organization called HFC, and 
Now we focus on a few things, mostly brain health education, especially for a younger generation. We found that most people conceptually don't even understand that you can take care of your brain. Uh, like if you don't smoke, your lungs are better. People don't know the equivalent of that. Probably with, with an odd brain. topic after exactly. what we talked yeah. about for 30 Actually, minutes. Actually, uh, with, with weed, but it's keep okay. Going. <laughs> <laughs> with weed, it's fine. Cigarettes, I'd say. But <laughs> and uh, so brain health education, and also we provide uh, in-home care for people. Um, who are taking care of their uh, loved ones. And by the way, when yeah. you called on that special, that family, to tell yeah. them you were going to give them 20 hours a week of support, I was so touched by that. Oh yeah, it's really nice. And a lot of Alzheimer's organizations really look on kind of creating this like magical cure and are not doing very much for people who are like today affected by the disease. And that's something that we really try to focus well, I know, on is I, helping people today. I know Kristen and I want to give a gift that so that we can help to give many hours to those families. Evan, do you want to touch on this before we run out of time? Uh, uh, Evan also yeah. has an organization, honestly, and it speaks to, I think, like, the thing we both saw, and it speaks to your passions, is like using your passions to create Evan, what's your uh, organization? A charitable organization. Uh, I got a nonprofit called Real Start. I'm passionate about education and kids. I love kids. I, that's, that's my foundation's yeah. biggest gift. Yeah, yeah I just did. Yeah. Educating kids is important, and, and I've always felt very lucky that we saw people making films in Vancouver. So we started an organization where we bring uh, job experiences to youths, and we create like short films with them in underserved communities, and then we show them the gamut of what you can do in Hollywood and the entertainment industry. He essentially gives like underprivileged high school kids movie stars to make short films with. <laughs> And then, and then help them get jobs. How do I become one of them? That's exactly. cool. You're too old, I'm sorry. And, and the results are, uh, yeah. <laughs> By the way, now you sound like my kids. Yeah, exactly. Well, guys, I will say, this has been a real highlight for me. Thank you so much for coming. You give so much to the world in the form of creativity and giving back. It's an honor to be here with you guys. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks for having us.